we have um, almost on a daily basis made our concerns clear to China. Uh, but at the same time, just let me stress that our, we have also agreed that the differences or we have in the South China Sea with China are not the sum total of our relationship with China. We have a, quite a, a vast or a, a quite a significant bilateral relationship with China and other areas such as in the economic sphere, cultural, etc. But uh, nevertheless, um, this, of course, remains a major challenge in our relationship. That is the situation in the South China Sea. Now, one of the other mechanisms which in this, and I have to stress all nations in Asia, as well as China, agree, there is a need to see whether you can come up with a code of conduct on the South China Sea. And uh, negotiations, uh, in fact, have uh, been taking, have been going on for the past four or five years. And... Um, I think we still have some way to go in the negotiations for a number of reasons. But just let me say first is that this is a negotiation between not uh, necessarily ASEAN and China, but it includes all the ASEAN. But it's really a negotiation among 11 countries, the, the 10 ASEAN and China. So you can imagine the complexities of this uh, kind of negotiation with uh, basically 11 countries. Though ASEAN does have general agreement on the broad contours, it's when we get to the specifics that we have a lot of discussion. And these are also quite technical in nature uh, in the code of conduct. So what I can say is that on the political level, China and all the ASEAN countries are committed to, to pursue the negotiations on an effective and substantive code of conduct. Uh, of course, there are many, as I said, many issues involved here, so we have to resolve them. So uh, let's just say that um, uh, we may not be seeing the light of the light at the end of the tunnel, but we see the tunnel, and that's where we are. <laughs> so uh, uh, now on the uh, oh, on the recent uh, pronouncement of the United States. Well, let me just uh, put this in proper context. The Philippines and the United States have our first treaty allies. We have a mutual defense treaty, and we also have additional arrangements such as the visiting forces arrangement, and. What was announced by the U.S. is just consistent, basically, with our treaty alliance. And, uh, of course, uh, every time uh, there's an announcement made, especially nowadays with the U.S.-China competition, uh, one side always tends to see it within the prism of their, their rivalry. So, uh, for example, in this case, uh, China has, uh, may have commented not only on that, but on some other issues, uh, always looking at it uh, from the U.S.-China rivalry. And uh, what we have consistently stated is that these uh, activities or actions that we are taking are, are purely within the context of our mutual defense treaty and uh, in accordance with our bilateral and national interests and not uh, in the context of any U.S.-China competition. And we have sought to make that very clear. And uh, we are looking at these um, in the context of our, our legitimate interests and our, and our needs in terms of our national uh, security and defense requirements and not aimed at any particular country. Uh, on then a question on the arbitral award. Uh, yes, the, um, uh, as I said, we successfully uh, won the, our case and uh, that was in 2016. Unfortunately, China does not recognize the award. Uh, we and many countries in, in the world recognize the arbitral award as final and binding. And, uh, and basically uh, a judgment on the, um, on the, uh, on the nine dash line, which China uh, was claiming. So um, we, are, we believe the arbitral award stands and that countries uh, uh, would be bound by the arbitral award. So we are um, looking at it in that way. And uh, I think many countries are espousing some of the uh, key provisions of the award, that is to allow for freedom of navigation within the South China Sea. And that is something which uh, uh, countries observe. So I think I would uh, more or less say that the arbitral award is final and is binding, and we leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you, Secretary Manalo. I've got so many hands up now. Uh, maybe I'll start here. Ambassador Guatemala, he raised his hands very early on. So well, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Director General Ambassador Vijay, for uh, convening us today. Also, it's a great pleasure to see uh, His Excellency Enrique Manalo, Secretary of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of the Philippines. We commend uh, his leadership. 
I am I was the deputy permanent representative of Guatemala for several years in New York and I remember very well his leadership particularly defending also the human rights of the migrants that's very important and also you were one of the pioneers with regard to the global compact for migration and I remember that during that time I think it was four or five years ago or a little bit less Not perhaps <laughs> yes uh, but with the Philippines uh, in the past also uh, Guatemala and the Philippines and also our Indian colleagues as well in the, in the UN in New York we established the International Day for Family Remittances which is an important day also commending the efforts of the migrants around the world now we see for example that migration continues to be a, one of the most important topics in the international agenda but uh, my question right now would be uh, how do you think we can put in the scope of the Security Council, particularly taking into account the changes on the climate change that is affecting the migration around the world, how the topic of migration could be included in the agenda of the Security Council or eventually to uh, adjust this to the reality, to the contemporary reality of the world. Again, my congratulations, distinguished Secretary of Foreign Affairs, and good to see you here as well as all your team, and thank you for the invitation today. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, okay, I'll take a one there, one hand there, and one hand here. Hi, sir. I'm Sidhan from Vion. Uh, so my question is, you're buying Brahmo's missile from India. How do you see India as a country from where you can buy defense assets for your country? Okay, one question here. Mani, you take the money. Uh, thank you, Excellency, uh, for a very nice lecture. Uh, I'm Captain KK from National Maritime Foundation. Uh, I had come across a media report uh, with regard to the India ASEAN uh, maritime exercises, where uh, it was reported that the Chinese maritime militia sought to uh, disrupt the exercises somewhat uh, by trying to get it to the same area of exercises and that the uh, Philippines uh, uh, Navy ships or maritime security agencies uh, tried to thwart it. My question is uh, uh, with regard to the veracity of the uh, media report and uh, since you are the government, maybe uh, I would like to know your perspective uh, with regard to uh, reality or otherwise of it. Thank you. Secretary Manalo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, well, on the on the first uh, question from our colleague from uh, Guatemala, of course, uh, uh, it's so evident now that climate change is really at the top of the, the almost at the top, or if not the top of the agenda, is probably one of the uh, major, or if not the major, uh, global uh, security challenge. And I think uh, this uh, already implies that climate change has had so many effects on so many issues and, and sectors in our societies and uh, it's certainly something that we have to uh, really address and I believe not only uh, in terms of uh, in the General Assembly but also in, in institutions such as the um, Security Council because they, it does pose a major uh, security threat in so many ways and, um, and I said since it influences so many sectors uh, this particularly includes the, its, the potential effects on migration. And, and the dangers that, for example, uh, natural disasters or even rising sea levels pose to the um, to, to countries and, and the implications this has on, on migration. So uh, I think this is certainly an issue which has to be uh, explored in more depth, especially from the uh, global and uh, regional and even national security angles, which makes it also a, a good candidate for the, uh, for the Security Council which, uh, by the way, the Philippines is running uh, for in uh, 2027, 20, 28. So you might be hearing more about this from us, especially these issues, uh, because these are new threats which we have to really address uh, through global cooperation. I think the, the issue of migration is very important, not only because the Philippines has a stake in this, but I think all countries have a stake and, and the implications climate change would have on migration flows. Uh, on the point of, uh, yes, well, uh, we certainly hope to develop a very robust defense uh, cooperation arrangement, uh, arrangements with, with India. We, we already have uh, entered into some potential deals, 
and I think we will be looking forward to having more. In fact, uh, that's one area which I hope to discuss uh, also during my meetings tomorrow with the Minister Jai Shankar and also our defense uh, officials have also been in contact regularly on this. So we certainly uh, view a, a partnership with India in the defense area as one of the uh, uh, brighter aspects of our future uh, relationship. Now, and I'm not talking about the long, the distant future, but in the near term. Uh, on the uh, ASEAN maritime exercise, I don't have the full uh, details of, the, of that uh, encounter, but I, I, all I can really say is that uh, ASEAN-India cooperation uh, in, this, in the maritime sphere is an important aspect of our collaboration. And the Philippines is also uh, very much behind ASEAN in that effort. Uh, uh, and also that we see great potential in Philippine-India uh, maritime cooperation and, and uh, increasing greater contacts in the maritime sphere, especially through uh, maritime domain awareness, greater collaboration with each other. And uh, again, another point that I might raise in my talks tomorrow too, that uh, we have a uh, wide, quite a, a wide range, a great scope for cooperation in this area. And I'm not only talking about military, but even in terms of uh, maritime domain awareness as a whole. Yeah, sure. uh, Secretary has agreed to take a few, uh, two more questions, so I'll take one from this side and one from this side. Uh, you have the floor, sir. Thank you. I'm Deepak Maheshwari from Ikriya, a think tank. My question is uh, specifically with respect to the word cyber you used at least four times in your uh, intervention. And uh, so in Philippines, we already have the Data Protection Commission, and I had a pleasure of interacting with the Data Protection Commission in Philippines. And in India, of course, we are still in the process of framing the data protection law. So one is uh, what type of cooperation opportunities that you see in this area, and specifically in terms of cybersecurity for fintechs, as you mentioned, uh, what are the specific issues that you want to sort of explore there? Thank you. Thank you. And one question from here, Mani Pant. Thank you, Excellency, for a very comprehensive lecture. My question relates to the impact of the ongoing war in Ukraine, which, as uh, we all know, has had global repercussions. So what is your assessment of the crisis on Southeast Asia and Indo-Pacific in the larger context? A follow-up question is, with respect to uh, your country dealing with supply chain disruptions in the wake of the war, given that both Russia and Ukraine have been major, had been major green suppliers to your country. Thank you. Okay, the Secretary has agreed to take more. more. Okay, I see one hand go up there. Okay, here Ambassador, Ambassador Goyal has a question. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Excellency Secretary Manalo. I was just wondering, basically, has ASEAN developed a common position on security architecture in Indo-Pacific? Uh, there have been several differences I see coming from different members. And you also mentioned the negotiations between China and ASEAN is actually 11 countries in negotiating with each other. Uh, I would be interested how the secret security architecture is evolving and how do you see Quad playing a role there? Okay. Thank you very much. Maybe I will uh, respond in... in uh reverse to the questions, if you don't mind. First on the, otherwise I might forget my reply to you. <laughs> the, uh, first on the ASEAN, on the security architecture, especially with regard to the, uh, the uh, Indo-Pacific. Well, ASEAN, uh, I think two or three, three years ago, uh, uh, adopted the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. And uh, that was uh, a, uh, a uh, negotiated text and it fully reflects, I believe, the general uh, principles and approaches with which the ASEAN countries as a whole, ASEAN as a whole, views the Indo-Pacific. And essentially, the, the, main, um, the main principles are, are that the Indo-Pacific should remain uh, open, inclusive, not aimed at any particular country or groups of countries. In other words, open to all. And uh, basic uh, principles would be it would subscribe to good governance, rule of law, uh, free and open trade, and, and cooperation in general. 
and we believe that uh, these are the uh, principles which should guide cooperation in the region and also uh, uh, make it the basis for an Indo-Pacific uh, regional uh, cooperation, even in the Pacific region. Uh, so that's where uh, ASEAN stands on that, and it's quite, and in fact, it's a very clear document which states our position. Uh, now, I mentioned the, um, on, in terms of the COC, uh, just to clarify, in the general principles, ASEAN is fairly uh, united on that. It's when we get to the nitty-gritty, as you know, in the negotiations where countries uh, uh, tend to have, I wouldn't say differences, but sometimes nuances in the position. And that's why uh, it's taking time, I believe, to, to uh, negotiate that. Uh, and of course, I, maybe I can just say, if I one um, issue that will have to be addressed at some point in the future, by all the countries, and this will involve each individual country, is whether the code should be legally binding or uh, not. Uh, we're not yet there. Uh, but that will certainly be one of the issues. And I think there you would have to say that uh, each country probably would have uh, to think about it first. But on the general principles, ASEAN is uh, definitely united in terms of how we approach the negotiations and what general issues or, uh, we are trying to address with China. But uh, again, let me say, China and the ASEAN countries, at least at the political level, are all committed to, to finalizing the code, uh, and in our case, to ensure that it is an uh, effective and substantive uh, code of conduct. Uh, on the issue of the, uh, uh, of the Ukraine, well, we, the President, uh, Marcus Jr., has always said that uh, uh, the uh, conflict in the Ukraine has had... Uh, is now can no longer be viewed as limited to just the that area. It has had effects uh, on, uh, in fact, almost every country. In the case of the Philippines, in terms of uh, uh, food security and uh, agriculture, and uh, this uh, has necessitated our uh, trying to forge greater partnerships with other countries in in uh, promoting and in and achieving uh, food security arrangements and agriculture. And it's also made us try to address other areas such as uh, renewable energy, et cetera. So uh, we feel that uh, this conflict has uh, certainly um, transcended and, and affected all countries in the world, which is why, of course, we are supporting all efforts to promote a peaceful resolution of the, of the conflict in the Ukraine. Uh, on, on cybersecurity, I mentioned uh, this is certainly an area which we hope to, to explore more fully with all partners, especially with India, given their uh, well-known um, uh, lead in this area. And we want to really uh, see in the Philippines how we can do this. In fact, uh, most recently now, I mean, just today, I, uh, uh, of course, the fact that we are deeply interconnected is, is there. But, uh, for example, we need to address issues such as uh, uh, even false news, uh, fake news, uh, which has just come out the other day, affecting even my department. So, uh, I mean, these are, these are issues which we need to address. I mean, they're so obviously false, but they do create a big following. And uh, I think in terms of cybersecurity, we would like very much to discuss areas where uh, we can address cyberterrorism. And even more recently, trafficking through cyberterrorism. We have, uh, that seems to be a new and emerging threat that a number of our citizens, not only the Philippines, but countries in our region, ASEAN countries, are being, uh, people are being affected by scams. And uh, we have uh, uh, had to address this by trying to rescue many of our nationals from this. So I think uh, this, this is a very new area, not new, but certainly an emerging area where we need to have cooperation, especially with countries such as India. I think we can work together for this. So actually there's quite a, a long list. And again, as I said, this is an area that we will discuss. Uh, in our talks and even after our talks, but certainly we are quite open to exploring these areas such as cyber terrorism uh, and uh, cyber trafficking. These are the negatives we have to address uh, with India especially. Thank you so much, Secretary Manalo. I do know that you have another appointment and uh, you have kindly agreed to join us for a cup of tea. But thank you so much for taking the many questions from the floor. And I think your answers have probably led uh, many other hands to go up. But then <laughs> there's always a time limit. And thank you so much for your time, Secretary Manalu, and for being with us here today at ICW.
On behalf of ICWA, I would like to take this opportunity to once again thank His Excellency Enrique Imanalo for graciously accepting our request of delivering the 42nd Sapru House Lecture on such an important topic. We have benefited immensely from your remarks and gained valuable insights. I also thank our audience this morning for their valuable participation in this event and enriching it with their meaningful observation and questions. May I now invite everyone for high tea in the foyer. Thank you all and have a good day.